Good morning, church. This morning, we're going to do something a little bit different this morning, something that's actually old school. I would say it's old school. In my grandmother's church, we did something every Sunday that I always found weird. It was called responsive reading time. And in the back of our hymns, in the back of our hymns, there's these pages where there's these words that were in bold, and then there are these words that were in italics, right? And we were supposed to say the words in italics after the preacher said the words in bold. Now, today, we're going to do it a little bit differently. Going along with our theme of coming out of Egypt, Arlene, did we talk this week about what I was preaching? No. For some reason, she knew. For some reason, Mark knew. For some reason, someone knew. We know who. There's a phrase that's been repeated a couple times today in our scriptures that no one knew I was going here. Okay? I gave Stephanie Isaiah 6, and I'm not starting there. I'm going there, but I'm not starting there. I'm actually going to be in Psalm 136. Now, if you don't have a Bible, your response is real simple. All you're going to say is, his love is endures forever. So let's all try it together. One, two, three. His love endures forever. I'm going to read a phrase, and then you're going to respond. His love endures forever. All right, here we go. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders, who by his understanding made the heavens, who spread out the earth upon the waters, who made the great lights, the sun to govern the day, the moon and stars to govern the night. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder and brought Israel through the midst of it. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the desert. I'm going to stop for just a moment. Give it a little gusto. My buddy Rob would say, put a little stank on it, all right? Give it some gusto, all right? All right. To him who led his people through the desert. Who struck down great kings. And killed mighty kings. His love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites. His love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan. His love endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance. His love endures forever. An inheritance to his servant Israel. His love endures forever. To the one who remembered us in our low estate. And freed us from our enemies. Who gives food to every creature. Give thanks to the God of heaven. Let's give God a hand clap. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. You know what? You just participated in an ancient custom that the Israelites actually learned in Egypt. Do you know that their form and their phrasing in worship, they learned in the culture and the world they lived in? The ancient Halals? They came from Egypt. And on the other side of the Red Sea, when they went into the wilderness and they had time to pitch their tents and to take a breath from running from Pharaoh... Moses and Aaron gathered up the children of Israel together and they sang 
this song. Moses would relate what had happened and the people would repeat and respond to him, his love, his mercy endures forever. You find this phrase in so many of the Psalms, especially towards the end of the book of Psalms, you'll find that phrase, his mercy endures forever or his love endures forever. And this practice of repeating the same phrase over and over and over again, they learned it in Egypt. It's interesting, isn't it? Now, with that thought in mind, you have to ask the question, well, how is it that they could take something out of the culture of a worldly pagan culture, a a worldly system and government that worshipped idols? How could they take a method and a practice from amongst them and use it for worship? Well, to answer that question, we have to understand what worship actually is. Now, this is not my definition. This is one that I've borrowed, one that Warren Wiersbe uh, has written about and that he writes in his book, uh, True and Real Worship. He says that worship is when the Lord, Jesus Christ, becomes the center, the focus, and the foundation for whatever you do. Let me say that again. When the Lord Jesus Christ becomes the center, the focus, and the foundation for whatever you do. It's when you focus on the Lord. Why do you do what you do? Now, there are many of us that get distracted, especially in worship services. Worship services, right? When we have meetings together, camp meetings and church services, and we we go to big conferences, there are so many things that can get in the way of worship. We'll be in a big, great building and some some hall where the echo and the sound and the acoustics are amazing, and we'll listen to, to the music, and we'll forget to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there are times where I'm up here playing the drums, and we're, we're singing a song of worship, and I'm so focused on hitting the toms and the cymbals at the right time that I forget to focus on the Lord, and I'm not worshiping, I'm just playing the drums. Then there are those other times where I feel like the entire praise band, we get caught up in the moment, we forget where we are, we're just thinking about how good God is, and we're we're singing the words, and it's reminding us of what Jesus has done for us, and we get, we use this word, we use this word a lot, we see we get caught up in the ecstasy. There's this overwhelming feeling of joy and peace and power that comes upon you. You're just focusing on the Lord. You you don't care if you hit the right note. You don't care if you're singing the right lyric. All you're thinking about is, Lord, you're so good. I'm praising you right now, and I get to praise you with my friends and my family. And, And that is an experience of worship. When you're focusing on the Lord, and he becomes the center, and he's the focus Notice that when they repeated this phrase back to Moses, they said his love endures forever. That God was the focus. What God did was the focus. And notice that everything Moses was saying to them were all things God did. He made the sun. He made the stars. He parted the Red Sea. He's the one that destroyed Pharaoh and his his horses and chariots. It was God that took us through. It was God that helped us defeat kings. It was God that gave us an inheritance, that the Lord himself was the center of the song. He's the focus. That's what worship is. It's when you focus and give yourself completely To him. In Isaiah chapter 6, there's a beautiful picture of worship. I think one of the most profound and mysterious pictures we've ever seen in Scripture of worship around the throne of God because it is a picture of the throne of God itself. In Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet Isaiah says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs. Seraphs. Interesting word. Seraphim. 
In the King James, it says above it stood the seraphims. Each had six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And picture this. Six wings, covering eyes, covering feet, two flying. Here's the problem. When you first read that, it's like, yeah, but what's the rest of them look like? You said seraphim. I don't even know what a seraphim looks like. So it's like I've described to you that they have eyes because they're being covered by two wings. They have feet, so they're being covered by two wings. And there's two that's flying. So I don't know what y'all got, but the picture I got is there's, there's six wings, right? The top two are covering the eyes because it makes sense. They're in close proximity. The bottom two are covering the feet and the middle ones they're flying with, right? It still doesn't explain exactly what they are though, does it? I hope this helps. The word seraphim or seraph in the Hebrew means burning ones. Preacher, that still doesn't help. So, like, they're a ball of flame with six wings, covering the eyes, covering the feet? Maybe. The Hebrew word is the burning ones. The ones engulfed in flame. I'll come back to that. Listen to what they say there in verse 3. And they were calling to one another... Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Notice the focus of the song is entirely God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth, the whole earth is mentioned, but the whole earth is not the focus. What does he say? The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their song is focused on God and his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. This is an awesome sight. So what we know so far is that these burning ones with six wings, they're covering their eyes, they're covering their feet, they're flying above the throne of God, and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. Now, turn with me to Revelation chapter 4. As you're turning there, I want to give you a, a couple little tidbits The prophet Isaiah wrote his prophecy. The year that King Uzziah died is in the 8th century BC. So approximately 800, between 700 and 800 years. Some scholars, the majority of the Orthodox believe around 740, 760, somewhere in that 20 year period there. So almost 800 years before the time of Christ, Isaiah writes these words that he saw the Lord, and he saw these strange creatures singing a song. Flash forward to the time of Christ and approximately 40 or 50 years after Jesus has ascended. That the Apostle Paul, or the Apostle John, sorry, the Apostle John is now an old man. He's been exiled to the island of Patmos. He's an old disciple of Jesus. And he receives a vision from the Lord in his old age, and he writes a prophecy, and contained within that prophecy in chapter 4, he sees a vision. It says there in chapter 4, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne In heaven, with someone sitting on it. Someone. Really, John? Someone? (sighs) You know who it is. All right, verse 3. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. And seated on them were 24 elders. 
They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, in the center of this scene, around the throne were four living creatures. Now keep in mind, the directions directions that John uses when he's describing it, he's just told us that these creatures are the closest to the throne than everything else. He says, in the center, around the throne, and that Greek word for around the throne is immediately around the throne, the closest thing to the throne. So there's these elders, right? There's this sea of glass. He sees this sight, but what's in the center closest to the throne are four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Listen to this description. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. Sound familiar? And was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Can you picture it? Is anybody weirded out? Does it sound like an old Grateful Dead fever dream? Like, these creatures, they have eyes covering their bodies and their wings on the inside and out. So on top of the wings, on the backs of the wings, eyes. Inside the wings, on the front, eyes. Everywhere. With all these eyes on them, he could still make out that one of them looked, what does he say there? Like a lion. One of them looked like an ox. One had the face of a man. And the other looked like a flying eagle. So a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. Six wings. Covered with eyes. Listen to this. Day and night, they never stop saying. That's a key phrase. Day and night, they never stop saying. Holy, holy, holy. It's like, is there an echo in here? I've heard this somewhere before, right? Right? Holy, 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 but listen to the difference. Is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come? Strange. It seems like the song has shifted. Remember what he said before in Isaiah? The holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. That that stayed the same, right? What did he say back then? The whole earth is filled with his glory. Now these creatures with the six wings are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Listen to this. When the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, there's your key to who's sitting on the throne. Because remember, John hasn't actually said who's sitting on the throne. He said someone. They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, they identify who's sitting on that throne. It's the Lord God Almighty. Now that seems like a simple thing for me to say. But let me tell you, a lot of people miss that. And I don't mean they miss that because they don't read this. A lot of people miss the point that the Lord God Almighty is on the throne because of the way we act. Whew. I'm preaching better than you're letting on. We act like, we act like we forgot. We're like, well, someone's on the throne. You know when we get all worried about things and we're scared and we're fearful? 
someone's on the throne. When we're acting up and we're being lustful and greedy and prideful and we hurt one another and we kill and we steal, someone's on the throne. But to the one who serves, the one who loves and gives, takes responsibility, raises up their children, gives to their neighbor, shows love, kindness, and mercy. To that one, their actions, their life testifies the Lord God Almighty is on the throne. This is worship. Now, I don't believe, this is just Don't take this as gospel or this is just my opinion. So if you're taking notes, just an opinion. My opinion is time doesn't work the same way in heaven the way it does on earth. Now, there may be some of you that agree with me. There are scriptures that say a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. Now, I don't think that that's some kind of standard metric of measurement that we should go by. So every day is a thousand years. It's like, well, yeah, and every, every thousand years is a day. You, you, you've just opened this thing like an accordion and then you've collapsed it on, on itself again. When you say one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as one day, it's, it's an expression, uh, it's, it's an over-the-top expression trying to communicate that God's eternal nature goes beyond what we can understand and fathom. That he's beyond time. That God's so eternal, he's going to win the waiting game. For most of us, well, according to the scriptures, we got about 70 years, 80, if perhaps we have some strength. Now, I know people live past that. The scriptures just declare that's kind of the average. Man has about 70 years. If he's got strength, about 80. Well, God's got all the time in the world. He will win the waiting game. He is eternal. And they communicate this by saying he's the one who is, or who was, who is, who is to come. Past, present, future. God is eternal. He's without time. Now, my personal opinion is I believe that God is outside of time. Now, my reasonings for that, I don't have enough time to go into it here, but I know that we do have some people who studied a little bit of physics and science that time has been said by some physicists that time is actually a physical property of this universe, that it's dependent upon gravity. Quick example. Supposedly, this is a theory, if we were to take twins born on the same day, put them in a rocket ship, send one of them to Jupiter and send one of them to the moon, and then bring them back. By the time that the one who went to Jupiter gets back, because the one who goes to the moon is going to be waiting for him, right? When his twin comes back to the earth, he's going to be about 14 years older than his twin. Now, I don't know how that works. I'm just telling you a theory that's out there, all right? There's this idea that time is part of this Space, this universe, this physicality that we live in. And God is outside of that. He has to be. He has to be because he's the creator of all things. Like I said, don't write this down and be like, hey, this is what the Bible says. No, 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 no. This is just what your preacher is spouting off at the mouth about, okay? You know, just don't, don't put any kind of weight on that. I'm just bringing it up as kind of to make a point here that God is outside of time and there are some people who have theories in science that agree with this idea of time being a physical part of the creation. So if that be true and God is outside of that, well, it makes this scene very interesting to me. Because he says that they're saying this day and night and they never stop singing this song. So let's flash back here to something we can understand. Time. 800 years before Jesus, Isaiah sees these creatures singing a song, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. 
almost 900 years later, John sees the same scene and they're still singing the same song. Listen, if we repeat the chorus one more time, don't get bent out of shape. Okay? I've heard some people complain. It's like they sing the same phrase like 12 times in a row with that real funky beat. It's like, have you read this book? Have you read this book? You have creatures that are the closest to the throne. They sing the same line over and over and over again, day and night, and they never stop. Here's the truth. If you were just caught up and upset that we sang the chorus one too many times, you just showed us that you weren't actually worshiping. That one hurt, preacher. Why do you got to say stuff like that? Listen, if you have a problem with singing the same words too many times, there are some of us, it's like, man, we're singing this song again. Well, you sang that last week. Do we have to sing, I'm a part of the family of God every single Sunday? Listen, just because I said that, does, don't, don't stop doing it, because I love that song. But there are sometimes in our minds, in our hearts, there are people that are like, we sing the same song every week. These guys are next to the throne of God. They are the closest creatures in proximity to God. I think the seraphim understands something that we don't. So I got no problem repeating a chorus. I got no problem with it. His love endures forever. How many times did you say it? His love endures forever. And for some of you, it got funnier and funnier the way we were doing it just because of how animated I was. Yeah, I seen you laughing back there, Ali. All right? Listen. Hey, listen, if you're new to our church, I will call you out, but it's all in love. We're family here. We're family here. These creatures, I've been obsessed with this. Ever since we were out in the parking lot worshiping, we had the privilege and the, and the blessing to have some of our people come back and return to us because of COVID. Because of this horrible disease that's out there that's hurting people, some great things have happened in my life. I got to sing some worship songs with Emily Flickinger and Sarah Flickinger again. I hadn't done that in a while, and I was kind of missing it. And when they came and they worshiped with us, we had such a ball. It was great. So I could be on the one side, I'd be like, what's happening in the world is terrible. We can't go inside the building. Or I could be like, hey, we're out in the parking lot worshiping God with some people we haven't done that with in a while. It's, it's about perspective. It's about perspective. Now, if a creature whose perspective, whose point of view is the throne of God is right here, and they choose to just sing holy, holy, holy all day and all night for at least, at a minimum, 900 years, surely I can get up on another Sunday and go one more time. Surely I could get up in the morning and read my Bible one more time. These seraphim convict me. They convict me. They are consistent and continuous in their worship of Almighty God. They never cease. They never stop. And I've, I've, I've even had the different um, arguments come up that a person might say with this thought. Well, sorry, well, that's specifically what the Lord made them for, so that's what they do. Scripture says you were made to worship him. You know that? You were made to worship God. 
David says in the Psalms, he says, with my innermost being and all that I am, I give thanks to the Lord on high who's made me. That David testified, my very existence tells me I was made to worship. So how do we solve the dilemma? And some of you are like, well, what, what dilemma? That's pretty clear, cut, and dry. You know, I'm made to worship God, so that's what I'm going to do. Here's the dilemma. You got to go back to work tomorrow, some of you. Right? Some of y'all, it's, it's going to be work to get through lunch today. Can I get a good amen, Right? <laughs> We got stuff to deal with in this earth. We have problems. We have homes to take care of. We got yards to mow. We got biscuits and gravy to fix. We got rooms to clean. Right? We got bosses to deal with. We got students to deal with. Amen, teachers? We got administrators to deal with. Amen, teachers? If you're an administrator, God bless you. <laughs> that is a tough job. Let's be real. That's a tough job. What do we do? How do we solve this dilemma? It's like, okay, I can't sit around and just flutter around and sing holy, holy, holy all day long, preacher. I want to sometimes, but I can't. How do I do what you're telling me I, sh I was made to do. Paul tells us one of the secrets. He tells us plainly in the book of Colossians chapter 3. This is worth underlining, highlighting, putting a star and an asterisk next to it and say, do this. Because it pertains to all things. Listen to this, what he says. Whew, I can hear pages rustling. Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to start there. I'll start there in verse 15. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word, the scripture, the Bible, let it live in you abundantly, richly. As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Look, verse 17. And whatever you do, whatever you do, in all things, no matter what, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I'm going to get up in the morning and let my knees hit that floor and I'm going to pray. Lord, let me do whatever in your name. I thank you that I can pray. I'm going to shuffle my way into the bathroom and turn the light on and look at myself in the mirror and turn the light back off because I don't like what I see. <laughs> I turn it back on, brush my teeth, wash my hands, wash my face. Thank you, Lord, that I have running water and that I have a mirror to look into. I can see what I look like and get the dirt off my face. And thank you for this click, 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 click electricity that I have here and shuffle my way into the kitchen and put the pot of coffee on and I put two pieces of toast in there and as I put the plunger down to push the switch and that toast starts heating up, Lord, thank you for the electricity that I could turn on the light that's powering this toaster and this warm cup of joe I'm about to have. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for feeding me my daily bread. What if you were to start your day that way? That whatever you do, everything you do, you do it with gratitude in your heart in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
you'll be like one of these burning ones. Your life will become an example, one that sings the praises, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory, who was and is and is to come. Let's follow their example. Day and night, everything that we do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus with gratitude and thankfulness in your heart. Will you stand and pray with me? Father God, thank you. I thank you that you made the seraphim these burning ones that burn with a fire and passion that comes from your glory and your presence. Lord, I thank you that you give us this vision of your throne, of how you are in charge. You are in authority and you will give us the strength to do everything, everything in your name. Thank you, Lord, for filling our hearts with gratitude and thankfulness. Open our eyes and our hearts to see all the greatness of your glory in everything. Lord, especially, help us to see the glory in that face that we see in the mirror, that you put your glory in us. The scripture says that you have glorified us in Christ Jesus that your glory is in us, the spirit of glory lives in us. Help us every day, every morning to begin and to end with you, everything that we do. Lord, I know it's gonna be a hard work to discipline ourselves to do this, Lord, but I believe it's worth it. And I believe it's what we've been made for, is to worship you in everything, in everything. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You accept the challenge? Starts with one thing. Decide. Make it up in your mind. Decide. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to do everything in his name. I'm going to try to follow him. Give it a shot. But you gotta choose first, you gotta choose him, you gotta decide to follow him. This morning I want this song to be not just an invitation, I want it to be a challenge, I want it to be a prayer that we're gonna follow him starting right now. Listen, yesterday's gone, you don't get yesterday back, all right? God loves you, God forgives you, you made some mistakes last week, let's start new. His mercies are new every morning, great is his faithfulness. God loves you. He is with you. Choose Jesus. Choose to follow him today. Let's sing.